Now once you have done all these mechanisms, how you are going to use them? So what I have shown you was the simplest possible models which were being used, but nature is not so simple, our profession is not so simple and that is where we have to take help for few models which define advective diffusive contaminant transport in tandem. In tandem means together, coupled phenomena. So, this is the form of the equation. If you do a lot of mathematical jugglery, you will end up getting this equation. Can you recognize few terms appearing here? Del C by del T is nothing but concentration gradient with respect to time. D i is diffusion coefficient. Del square C by del X del Z square is variation of concentration with respect to distance. What is V s? Seepage velocity. Del C by del Z is nothing but again concentration gradient in the distance domain. Road dry is the density of the media. What is K d? K d is the distribution coefficient divided by porosity of the porous media multiplied by del C by del T. I have not intentionally shown the derivation of this equation which will take lot of time, but I just wanted to show you how these type of equations can be used for simple modeling purpose. So, if I ask you a question in broad sense what this parameter corresponds to d i into del square c by del z square sinivas, what would be this term? This is diffusive contaminant transport. What about this term? Del C by del Z into V S advective contaminant transport. What about this thing which I have encircled? This is the retardation of the porous media. See the flux is moving from one point to another point what you are trying to find out is the rate of change of concentration. So, rate of con see how concentration is moving from one point to another point, it is nothing but primarily because of diffusion. If there is a seepage velocity, the concentration gets reduced. So, you have reduced this much value from this term. So, diffusive contaminant transport minus advective contaminant transport minus retardation capacity of the porous system. So, when you say retardation capacity of the porous system, these two terms are very well known to you. It is nothing but the porous media characteristic which you have been talking about. Now, the term which is appearing for the first time or which is quite new for you is K d. Now, this is what is known as distribution coefficient. What is the meaning of term distribution? See, this is what I have shown you earlier that if you allow enough time for a contaminant to come in contact with the porous system because of very low seepage velocities. What is going to happen? It starts communicating with the porous media. Now, how much communication is going on is nothing but distribution. That means, what percentage of contaminant gets or is getting interacted with the porous media. So, that means, this is where we say what is the fraction of the contaminant which is getting distributed from a liquid phase to the solid phase of the soil mass. So, you should appreciate that these are all philosophies and philosophies have been put in mathematical forms. Clear? So, now let me ask you a question. If K d is much more what happens to the concentration at a given point and whether it whether this type of situation is useful helpful to you or not that's right what is the meaning of this if you have a clay barrier where the clay minerals are very active what is that they are doing they are that's right correct so this is the whole philosophy of designing a clay barrier system you have to design clay barriers using a sieve, I am using the word sieve, which not only 
allows water to move out, but it stops cations also from the solute or contaminant. So, the name of this type of sieve is molecular sieve. That means, your porous media is acting now like a molecular sieve. It will not allow certain molecules to even pass through itself and that becomes the best possible barrier system which should be utilized at a waste containment facility. Is this part clear? Clear? Now, DC by DT you can obtain very easily. You can measure the concentration by conducting either the bore holes or in the laboratory you can measure repeatedly after certain time by taking a sample or dosing and then you can measure by using atomic absorption AAS or ICP or whatever. So, this term is very well known DC by DT. DI you can obtain by conducting different experiments. I have shown you one experiment in the previous lecture by using diffusion cells. Del, del square C by del Z square can also be obtained rate of change of concentration with respect to time. You can monitor at two, three different places how concentration is changing and you can know the concentration profile change. V s is easily measurable. The most challenging task is K d and this is a big headache. Government of India spends almost not less than 100 crores rupees in the research where K d determination should be done very precisely. Most of the mines where uranium is being taken out, if your K d parameter is not determined properly, the life becomes hell clear. So, one side too much of industrialization, too much of mining activity, okay, very good for your nation to become a high profile nation, but then second side what is going to happen? Your own populace is going to die because of all this contamination. So, this becomes a very tricky issue. So, there is a very big exercise going on right now where K D determination has to be done in different labs. About 22 labs have been selected in the country, our lab is one of them. And we are now trying to formulate a methodology to streamline the methodologies and methods which are adopted for determination of K D. Okay. So, the first step in modeling would be after you have got these parameters, you should get an answer from this equation in the form C as a function of T and Z. So, what is the concentration at a given time at a given distance? That is what you are interested in as a user. So, d i is the diffusion coefficient and k d is the distribution coefficient. Now, with this information, I would be in a position to take you into the world of sorption desorption mechanisms. I hope you will appreciate this. Unless this was given to you, there is no point talking about sorption and desorption process. Most of the mathematical models are available these days in the form of finite element codes and finite difference codes and uh, there are several commercially available packages which are available uh, which can give you a solution to ADE. This is also known as ADE advection diffusion equation. Now, let me ask you a question whether this is a one dimensional equation or a two dimensional equation or three dimensional equation. It is a one dimensional equation. So, you should appreciate the point that one dimensional equation will have its own limitations when you solve the real life problems. So, that is where you have to talk about del c by del t as a function of del c by del z, del c by del x, del c by del y. So, keeping the time domain constant, how the distance domain is varying in terms of concentration becomes a real challenge. All right. Okay. So, I hope this part is clear that there is a new term defined as k d and we have to obtain k d by somehow. So, this we will talk, talk about a bit later. Let us understand what are the parameters or the factors which decide the type of contaminant transport mechanism. So, the first is grain size. I have given you some very raw examples like sand and clay and what is the difference between the mechanism of contaminant transport in sands and clay, advection, diffusion all right. So, grain size is very important, density is very important, seepage velocity is extremely important concentration of contaminant is very important, viscosity of the fluid or this solute is very important, hydraulic conductivity of the media is very important, 
then comes factors affecting the behavior of contaminant. So, these are two different things. These parameters influence the mechanism. You agree? So, mechanisms are four advection, diffusion, dispersion, and hydrodynamic dispersion. So, these are the parameters which are going to define what type of mechanism going to prevail in a system. Now, the factors affecting the behavior of contaminant or the fate of contaminant. So, the first one is contaminant itself, whether it is reactive or non reactive, clear or radioactive or decaying type. There could be a contaminant which does not come out of the porous system, it gets decayed completely within it. All right. So, there could be a situation. The second term would be soil condition. What type of soil conditions you are talking about? and of course, the mechanism which is going to govern. So, the whole idea of showing you these, these points is, <laughs> what is the point? I think this is what I wanted to demonstrate to you. Ultimately, it boils down to the mechanism which is governing the contaminant transport. So, it is not a very easy and simple way of uh, modeling, though it appears to be because this term itself will take care of all these parameters plus many more parameters into account. Okay, let me quickly run through. If you, are, if you want to do modeling, what are the parameters which would be required? So, concentration C of a contaminant in the porous media can be defined by these factors. So, C is a function of viscosity, diffusion coefficient, sorption coefficient, seepage velocity, surface tension, density of the fluid, g value, gravity, two type of dimensions I have used here. You are doing a course on centrifuge modeling. So, I am sure that uh, you must, you, you would have been using this type of equation which are nothing but pi Buckingham theorems. So, multiplied by the time and the soil properties. Soil properties happen to be lumped parameter. It is very difficult to distinguish between one property and another property just like that. So, concentration of contaminant in the pore solution of the pore water is defined by these parameters, where mu is the dynamic viscosity of the fluid, d is the diffusion coefficient, s is the mass adsorbed of the contaminant per unit volume, V s corresponds to the interstitial flow velocity is nothing but seepage velocity, T f is the surface tension of the fluid particle interface, rho f is the density of the fluid, g is the acceleration due to gravity. L is the characteristic macroscopic length. What is macroscopic length? Physical dimension. So, my question to you is if I am using or let me not ask you, let me let me show you how it will vary. You should you should try to catch the point that what is the difference between macroscopic dimensions and microscopic dimension. So, L mu is the characteristic microscopic length which is nothing but the particle size and of course, your t is nothing but the time. So, all these parameters are required to form a pi Buckingham theorem. How many parameters you have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So, out of 11, how many equations can be formed? Ten clear? The most vulnerable set of the equations would be with 9 unknowns. If I make two parameters dependent on each other. So, that means, any contaminant transport problem will have at least 9 parameters, which either you have to know beforehand or you have to determine or you have to compute it by some mechanism. So, this is just to show you the complexity of the problem when you talk about contaminant transport in porous media. Now, your colleagues from hydraulics cannot deal with such a complicated situation, because what they deal with is all these things will have disappear there. Soil properties, microscopic length, macroscopic lens will not come to the picture. Your seepage velocity is nothing but discharge velocity. Diffusion coefficient also becomes a free molecular diffusion in water. So, it is very easy to obtain it. Clear? So, there it is a subset of the problem which we are talking about. So, contaminant transport in porous media happens to be a very, very broad problem, though 
fundamental transport in free water supply happens to be a subset of it clear so just to give you an idea about how modeling has to be done now when you do modeling you must have learned a lot in your centrifuge modeling course that you require some dimensionless numbers so these are the coefficients of contaminant transport mechanisms which you have to generate out of those nine parameters which govern the contaminant transport so the first parameter is known as concentration number so concentration number is nothing but concentration divided by density of the fluid and this ensures similarity of concentration of you know homologous points in the sample and the prototype advection number advection number is nothing but seepage velocity multiplied by time divided by macroscopic or microscopic macroscopic that's right the physical length of the sample so this will ensure kinematic similarity of motion in the model and the prototype diffusion number diffusion number is nothing but d multiplied by t upon l square so l square upon t is nothing but inverse of d in dimension so this becomes a non dimensional number so this ensures similarity of diffusion process in the model and prototype capillary effects number most of my students are working in capillary effects on the soil in fact you may also be working in the same sneha so how do you define capillary effect number is the surface tension coming to the picture microscopic length macroscopic length multiplied by the gravity effect and the fluid density so truly speaking this is nothing but the ratio of the surface tension force and the inertia forces inertia is nothing be because of density of the fluid so inertial forces divided by the surface tension forces are nothing but the capillary effects so this talks about similarity of the capillary effect in the model and prototype adsorption number how much is getting sorbed onto the system divided by density of the fluid so a very very dense fluid may have more sorption or less sorption is a difficult question to answer because again it will depend upon the activity of the fluid but a good way of defining adsorption number would be a dense fluid like honey whether it will diffuse easily in the porous system or water will get diffused into the porous system with some contaminants correct so that means a denser material should have lesser sorption into the system similarly your dynamic effect number so dynamic effect numbers are nothing but macroscopic length or microscopic length macroscopic length physical dimension of the system because gravity is coming to the picture so l upon t square is nothing but inverse of g so this becomes a non dimensional number now the way i look at these numbers is these are nothing but the controlling valves what is the meaning of this if i want to study what type of phenomena is going to occur in a porous system when a sudden contaminant comes in contact with it if i use these numbers i get a very clear cut mathematical image of the mechanism which is going to prevail in the system otherwise you can't perceive and visualize it but if you are playing with these numbers it gives you a feeling that if number is between a and b this type of mechanism is going to prevail if this number is between c and d this type of situation may prevail or may not prevail that means what you are doing is now you are one step very close to quantifying mathematically the mechanism which is going to govern in a porous media so remember what we have done we have talked about different mechanisms we have talked about the models we have emphasized on how to get the parameters which are involved in the models and now we are talking about how to quantify the whole process this is part clear so there are four steps in contaminant transport mechanisms when we talk about contaminant transport in porous media well there are few anomalies what are the anomalies discrepancies the discrepancy number 1 is the reynolds number you have been dealing with reynolds number always when you talk about seepage flow how do you define this term is a inertial forces divided by viscous forces so this is nothing but the inertial force rho f is the density of the fluid multiplied by seepage velocity multiplied by why microscopic why not macroscopic 
that is right because of this is the seepage which is taking place through pores that is right. So, please remember this that this is not the macroscopic number and then we use another word or another number which is known as pecklet number. So, pecklet number talks about concentration migration particularly dispersion phenomena. So, you have seepage velocity multiplied by again the microscopic length of the sample specimen divided by diffusion coefficient. Now, discrepancy is in the way that truly speaking there is a school of thought which says that Reynolds number should also get modeled when you do different modeling exercise, but then a great respite is even if it gets modeled the Reynolds number is so low that even if you multiply by 300 it is always going to be less than 1. This type of analysis and debate was presented by Dr. Ashok Gupta in lot of his papers who worked on the centrifuge modeling of uh, seepage analysis. So, this is where we defended our analysis by saying that R e has to be always less than 1 otherwise this is not a flow through porous system it becomes a open file open pipe flow where R e varies from 1 to 10 which is not the case with any soil or rock system. Now, comes the second issue that is the pecklet number. So, pecklet number even if it is higher than certain n value, n value is nothing but acceleration or artificial environment condition. So, here also p is going to be less than 1 and order magnitude of p in R e would be in 10 power minus 7, 10 power minus 6. So, any acceleration level which you may apply on the soil sample would not cross R e and p e more than unity. Clear? So, I have defined these coefficients over here the relationship between P e and R e. So, if you just substitute these terms and you derive equation you will find that P e equal to mu divided by rho f into d into R e. Now, this becomes a coefficient which relates Reynolds number with pecklet number. Again I will repeat Reynolds number is nothing but the number which controls seepage or the flow in porous system and pecklet number is the number which regulates transportation of contaminants from one point to another point. If there is no flow, there will not be any contaminant transport except for the case when you are talking about diffusion. So, this is where R e becomes much, much, much less. So, mu is the viscosity of the contaminant, rho f is the density of the contaminant, d is the diffusion coefficient of the contaminant, rho f is the fluid density, v is the seepage velocity, l u is the characteristic microscopic length such as particle size, it is equal to d 10 or d 50 of the mean particle or the mean particle size of the system. How do you define mean particle size? If d 10 d 50 is known, not average. There are, there are different ways of defining average particle mean particle size. The way I would like to define this is under root of d 10 into d 50. This is again depending upon different research groups and authors. So, as you say normally d 10 plus d 50 by 2 is never done. <laughs> it is I know, but when you talk about the mean particle size it has to be a sort of a uh, you know um, g p of the two terms. So, it is a very interesting world of researchers. Uh, now, I will show you how these modeling can be done. Now, this paper was the, uh, presented by my students Sridhi Burton and Morans uh, at a conference. What we did is actually my dream is to develop this model further if you plot pecklet number and Reynolds number on x and y axis, you have four types of contaminant transport mechanisms. So, depending upon in which zone the values are falling without doing much of you know analysis, I can tell you immediately that what type of mechanism is going to control. This is what actually I would have uh, loved to do halfway through. So, most of the points which we could do are falling in dispersion. It is very difficult to model soils 
to get some results in advection diffusion and diffusion zones though it looks very easy but you make a sample and repeatedly you will end up because we did lot of analysis here 3 3 7 plus 10 13 15 about 45 samples we have tested here each point corresponds to almost 3 repetitions or 4 repetitions. So, advection is very easy to get. Now, in sands if I keep on adding clay what is happening? I am I am traversing from right hand side to the left hand side. So, that means Reynolds number is decreasing and so is spectrate number clear. So, I fall in this domain, but this domain itself is such a big domain where I can reduce Reynolds number, but then I should have expected increase in peclet number. So, that becomes a modeling challenge. I am just trying to show here that two numbers can also be correlated with each other and if you have a sort of a electronic interface. Uh, okay, where automatically P and R E are recorded from a landfill and you have a database of this type where immediately you will come to know what type of mechanism is going to prevail in this landfill and you can take precautionary measures. Is this part clear? Yes, in some of the situations yes you can create. So, artificially you can induce Reynolds number which are much much higher which are even peclet numbers will also become very high because of that. Okay. So, these are situations which you can simulate, but, but the most trivial situation would be in this domain, but nature does lot of contaminant transportation only in this domain. So, all your salt water intrusion problems are somewhere here, a bit of them will be falling in advection diffusion. So, what is happening? R e is increasing at the cost of P e, here P e is increasing at the cost of R e. So, these are perfect, if, if this line goes in this direction, it becomes a pure clay aquifer. If this line goes in this direction, it becomes a purely sandy dip aquifer. So, you can do modeling for a certain type of aquifer also if you have this type of a database. All right. I hope you must be clear by this time that how these parameters can be utilized in solving real life problems. So, let me quickly finish now sorption process. So, sorption is nothing but you have any grain or a parking space in general where most of the cations come, molecules come, they get adhered to this, they get parked over here. So, in simplest possible form this is the sorption phenomena. So, it has two components absorption and adsorption. What is absorption? Atoms or molecules move into the bulk of a porous material, example the absorption of water by a sponge. Now, once this mechanism is over then the tendency of the system is to migrate into the molecules or atoms. Now, this is what is going to be adsorption. So, if you read the definition atoms or molecules move from the bulk phase that is solid, liquid or gas onto a solid or liquid surface. So, it is a further penetration. So, purification by adsorption where impurities are filtered from the liquid or gases by their adsorption onto the surface of a high surface area solid such as activated charcoal. So, this is the basic difference between the two absorption is still is a physical phenomena. However, adsorption has to be a physico chemico mineralogical phenomena. That means, this is where all the activities of or the total activities of the system comes to the picture. This is part clear. Terms related to sorption are adsorbates that is the molecules that have been adsorbed onto the solid surface, substrates or adsorbent the surface to which adsorbates are adsorbed. In case of adsorbed cations tightly held on the surfaces of negatively charged dry clay particles, clay particle is substrate and cations are adsorbates I have missed sorry it should be adsorbates. 
So, it is a good schematic diagram, these slides have been prepared by Suchit. So, you have a clay particle which is negatively charged and then the cations are adhering to this clay platelet. So, it is a electrical balance is there first of all that nullification of charge is there. So, this type of mechanism where the cations are getting parked onto the clay particles is a sort of a sorption phenomena. All right. So, clay particles are providing enough space for the cations to come and get parked over there. The reverse mechanism is desorption that means, whatever gets out freely. So, a phenomena whereby a substance is released from or through a surface becomes a desorption phenomena. Process is the opposite of sorption and occurs in a system being in the state of sorption equilibrium between bulk phases. All right. A good example of this would be you have these water filters which are normally used in the home. So, dirty water you have a sludge formation on the candle of the water filter. All right. So, it is a simple absorption process first of all, but because of the impurities which are quite active the tendency of this system would be to migrate into the candle or that calcium carbonate thing which is the candle. So, it migrates into it. So, suppose if you do not wash it for several months and then take fresh water supply and keep this candle over there, what happens? There is a reverse migration of all the sludge which is formed under the candle into the fresh water. So, this becomes a sort of a desorption process. Now, these mechanisms are normally used when you are dealing with remediation techniques in the real life. So, when the concentration of the pressure of substance in the bulk phase is lowered, some of the soft substance move to the bulk state. So, these are the copy book style of defining the desorption process. Now, this is the slide which shows these processes in the simplest possible form. You have the clay layers in which the cations are getting logged or parked. So, they are strongly sorbed into system when the system is dry. You add water to this, there is a hydration going on and there is a detachment from the surface of the clay and you keep on doing this process much more, much more water if you add what happens? All of these systems are free to come out. So, that is what I have written here that clay layers you have cations which are trapped into this, these are nothing but the adsorbed ions cations. In the dry condition cations are strongly sorbed on clay particles. You add a bit of water, so water molecules make them quite hefty. The tendency is to get detached from the clay platelet, it is a sort of a desorption process which has started. So, the water molecules wedged into the interlayer after adding water and this is the final stage, this is the intermediate stage. So, the cations get fully hydrated which results in their sorption from clay surface. So, this is how the sorption desorption mechanism keeps going in the nature. All right. So, I will stop here today.